Have you ever received a call that changed your life? Maybe it was the test came back negative, or you got in, or maybe that dreaded, we have to talk. A few years ago, I got a call that changed my life. I had just gone to bed, and at 1025, the phone rang, and the caller ID came up, and it was from a town in Central California, the town next to where I knew that my mom and dad had been spending some time doing mission work. And a call late at night is rarely a good thing, but this one really, when I saw the caller ID, I knew something bad had happened. I picked up the phone, and my mom told me that my dad had passed away that day. She was calling from the hospital where he'd been pronounced. It changed everything for us. And you've received calls, whether good ones or bad ones, that have shaped your life. The question I've got for you today is, have you ever heard the voice of God? Because I want to talk to you about someone who got a call from God and how that call shaped his life and how that same call, as we had apply, it, apply it to us, can shape your life as well. First of all, I'm going to talk to uh, you about how that call in the scriptures shaped me. Uh, as I've been pre preparing to come back to work after several weeks away on rest leave, uh, people have asked me the question, Chris, are you ready to be back? No, it's a tough question to answer because I really enjoyed the time away. It was a great time away. I, I had lots of time to connect with friends and family. There was lots of time for resting. There was lots of time for reading. There was lots of time for riding. I put lots of miles on my mountain bike this summer. And we got around to places in the province uh, that we might ordinarily not be able to go uh, just because we had weekends free. And so even though we were in church every Sunday this summer, we were in church in different places and we got to experience that. So it was a, it was a great time away. But I knew something going into my time of leave. I knew that I needed more than just a vacation, more than just a little time off. See, if all you do is check out for a while, then you come back to the same situation that you left. There's some wisdom from uh, a Canadian church leader uh, from the East Coast named Kerry Newhoff, and he says this. He says, your time off can't save you if your problem is how you spend your time on. I'll say that again. Your time off can't save you if the problem is how you spend your time on. And so I realized, even going into my time of leave, and I realized in the middle of it, that rest alone, play alone, recreation alone, wasn't what I need. The best thing that I could bring back to my situation, to the church that I love, was a different me. Now, a few weeks ago, when the clock was beginning to tick more loudly in my mind, because I knew that uh, my time of returning to work was coming soon, uh, there was a night, kind of late August-ish, where I woke up middle of the night, three in the morning, and I was soaking wet. I mean, I, I needed a towel off. I was so wet and sweaty and just filled with anxiety. How can I do it? How can I lead this church, especially now, after all we've been through? How can I be the pastor they, they need me to be? Am I even supposed to be a pastor? And the overwhelming feeling in me was one of complete powerlessness. Now, what do you do to address your anxiety? What's your escape hatch when you feel pressure or stress? Everybody's got one. We've all got, you know, go-to uh, coping mechanisms that we use when we feel anxiety. Some people try to do something mindless to get their mind to just turn off and get the thoughts to stop spinning. Uh, you know, in the last year and a half, along with ramping up of COVID cases, there's been a ramping up of Netflix. People want to watch something just to take their minds off of what they're going through. Some people watch something. Some people want to buy something. Some people want to eat something. Some people want to drink something. Some people want to smoke something. Some people just get busy. And some people get obsessed. I've got my coping mechanisms, like everybody does, and um, some of my coping mechanisms are healthy and, and some of them aren't. But that night, after 
trying my typical approach of listening to a podcast, uh, which I often do. I'll, I'll just play a podcast or an audio book or even a sermon. Yes, I use sermons to fall asleep just like you do. I, I just put it on my phone right beside me on my pillow so it's real close and quiet so only I can hear it. And that wasn't working. So instead of tossing and turning and trying to fall asleep, I decided to do the opposite of what I felt like, and I just got up. I got up, put on my pajamas, went into the living room, turned on the light, and sat down and decided I was just going to spend some time with God because I couldn't sleep. So I sat down, I I asked God, what do you have to say to me? Apparently, we're both up. What do you want to say? And so I, I picked up my Bible, and I turned to the next place in my Bible reading plan that I was supposed to read. And by the way, that's one of the reasons I love a Bible reading plan is because God picks the passage that I'm going to read next. And I don't just go to my favorites. And so that night, I turned to the passage that was the next thing that was on my list to read. And it was Isaiah 6. It's commonly referred to as Isaiah's call. And it says this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a high and lofty throne, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphim were standing above him. They each had six wings. With two, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet, and with two, they flew. And one called to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. And the foundations of the doorways shook at the sound of their voices, and the temple was filled with smoke. And then I said, Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and live among a people of unclean lips, and because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, and in his hand, was a glowing coal that he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your iniquity is removed and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord asking, Who will I send? Who will go for us? I said, Here I am. Send me. What I needed to know In answer to that question is, am I even called to do this? God took me straight to that passage and reaffirmed, yes, this is my plan for you. Here's my word. And and he took that word from the scriptures, his unchanging word, and he took it straight into my life. And I I believe that that's a message for all of us. And I want to help us all see some key points in Isaiah's encounter with God. Now, I'm stealing these four points. I copied them onto a note and stuffed them in my Bible many years ago. I never thought I'd use them. I thought it was just for me, but here we are today. And they are this, that Isaiah saw something, Isaiah felt something, Isaiah heard something, and Isaiah did something. You can track along with me. First of all, Isaiah saw something. In the year King Uzziah died. So just to give you some context here, this is around 740 B.C., and King Uzziah has been on the throne in the southern kingdom of Judah for 52 years. He's reigned for a long time. He's overall one of the good kings of Judah. Not a perfect man. He had his flaws. He made his mistakes. But overall, one of the better kings in Judah. Now, Judah and and the northern kingdom, which was called Israel, they had split. There'd been a civil war between them. and, uh, And Judah was the southern kingdom, and it was centered in Jerusalem. And... King Uzziah had ruled over a lengthy era of national prosperity and growth and safety. But he died. I want to ask you, who do you look to or or what do you look to for your sense of well-being? Because whatever it is, it will eventually end. King Uzziah, this great leader, and, and, and some people are looking for, you know, can we find the next great leader? Can I find some great media personality? Can I find a YouTuber? Can I find an author? Can I find an authority who will give me a sense 
that things are going to be okay. Or maybe you line yourself up with the, the right product or the, the right lifestyle and you hope that it's going to make the difference. But whatever it is, if it's not God, it's going to end. For some people, it's their job. Their sense of well-being and security is their job. But that can be threatened. For some people, it's their abilities or their good looks or their, even their health. And all those things can be threatened. And for some people that say, I don't need anything else as long as I've got my family, my security, my well-being, just my sense of equilibrium in life that it's going to be okay is because I've got a great family and we're tight. But all of those things can be threatened. Nothing can sit on the throne forever. And my question is, what will happen when it is threatened? What will happen when it ends? King Uzziah died. But Isaiah saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. The undying king who holds court forever. His rule never ends. That's who Isaiah saw. And who is this king? God is, is holy. He's set apart. He's so special. He's completely other than anyone or anything else. You know, this concept of holiness, what is that? It's, it's something set apart. It's something special. It's something that isn't common. You know, I, I used to have garbage knives in my kitchen, and they're really bad for cutting anything. And I, I got tired of them, and I found out, oh, you can have better knives than this. And so I got some decent knives, not real expensive ones, but decent knives, and I learned how to keep them sharp. And uh, I learned that some of having good knives in your kitchen, which makes cooking and preparing food so much of a pleasure when they actually cut, so much of that is not just how you sharpen them, but how you treat them. Because knives are set apart. They're, they're for cutting. Uh, a knife is not a screwdriver. A knife is not a pry bar. A knife is not a scraper. A knife shouldn't be cutting on every surface. There, there's a cutting board for a reason. And when I learned that a glass cutting board is a bad idea because it hurts the blade, I switched and things went so much better for me. My knives now are something other. And they're sharp and they work and they're a pleasure to work with. Now, that's just a really petty illustration, a small, small scale illustration of how much better things get when we understand otherness, specialness, set apartness. God is so much bigger than that. He is utterly other. And that's why, because he's so different, because he's special, because he's set apart and untainted by everything else, that's why he can answer our deepest needs like no one else. He can do what no one else can do. But when Isaiah saw God, the one who is utterly other than us, Isaiah felt something. In uh, verse 5, I, I love the way the New Living Translation translates this. He says, then I said, it's all over. I am doomed, for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. This God who is so powerful, so perfect, is also so different from me. He's pure and perfect. The, uh, the ESV study Bible puts it this way. I really like it. The holiness of God is such that the very sight of him seems as though it would be fatal to a sinner. In fact, that echoes the words of God in Exodus 33, verse 20, where God told Moses, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. And Isaiah understood this. Isaiah says, I, I live in a land of liars, and I'm one of the... We're all hypocrites. I'm not holy, and he is. You know, it's it said that we are living in a postmodern world. Uh, many of you have probably heard that. And modernism, to be postmodern, is to be past modernism. And, and modernism is an idea, I mean, it goes back to the 1700s. Modernism is, is the idea that science and technology, if we just make enough progress, science and technology will reveal truth to us and and that that can save us. You, you find that truth and it will set us all free. But 
after we've lived through the last century, the 20th century, of people using all that science and technology to kill each other on a grander scale than ever imagined, it sort of has diminished the idea that modernism is the answer. We thought we would just continue to progress into a better society and it would save us, and it didn't. It just about destroyed us. So postmodernism comes along, and postmodernism says maybe no one's right. Maybe there is no truth. Maybe we just need to let everybody discover what's true for them. You know, you do you, I'll do me, and, and we'll all be okay. But the, the thing is, it, it doesn't work out very well in everyday life. Uh, you know, you, you make the statement, or somebody makes the statement, that there is absolutely no absolutes, and you ask them, is, is that absolutely true? And that philosophy of life starts to unravel. And we don't live as, in everyday life as if it's, true, as if it's workable. Uh, nobody wants to show up at the bank and have their bank telling them that, you know, that may be $100 to you, but to us today, it feels more like 50. You know, we want there to be an objective, absolute truth. And everybody defining their own truth ends up bumping into somebody else eventually. Reality matters. We've found this out. But there's a, a word that has begun to define the era that we are moving into. In uh, 2016, during a U.S. election year and the Brexit referendum in the U.K., the Oxford Dictionary named its word of the year, and its word of the year that year was post-truth. And we are moving into an era where, where people will say not, not just that there's truth and we can find it and it will save us, and not that Maybe there's no truth at all, and nobody has a corner on the truth, so you just need to find truth for yourself. The post-truth era says, yeah, there's truth out there. There is an absolutely true thing. But it actually doesn't matter as long as I get what I want. And it doesn't matter where you fall on the political spectrum. Your basic assumption today is that not only are the people on the other side possibly wrong, but they can't even be trusted. They're making it up to suit their preferences, and it just becomes about who can shout loudly enough to gain and to keep power. Now, Isaiah, in his generation, said, everyone has filthy lips. In the face of somebody so perfect, so other, Isaiah realized, I live in this perverse generation, this lying generation, and I'm no better. Because I want it my way too. And only God is ultimately pure. How can we even get close to a king like that? And that's where Isaiah heard something. See, God made a way for Isaiah to be clean. God touched the place in Isaiah's life where he felt shame and inadequacy. And he told Isaiah through that angel who touched his lips with the coal from the altar, you've been made clean. Your sin has been paid for. See, here's our message. Here's what we celebrate. Here's our hope. That the only way to be right with a perfect God is if God does it for you. And God did it for Isaiah. This world-making, world-shaking God says, you're okay. You can stand when the rest of the world is shaking. That's what he did for Isaiah. And he wants to do it for you. Isaiah heard something. You're forgiven. God made a way. And Isaiah then did something. Isaiah stood up and he said, I'm ready to serve. I'm, I'm ready. You've called me and I'm now ready to go out and call to others. Why? Because you've called me. In a world filled with uncertainty, in a world filled with threats, Isaiah could answer with confidence because he'd been called. You can have confidence moving into a very uncertain future if you know who's called you. You need to know that you've been called. You need to know who you're walking with. You know, the, the last two weeks of my time off has actually not felt very much like vacation because I had to do something about a problem in my downstairs bathroom where we have a, a, a renter that, that lives down there and one moved out, and we found out there was massive damage behind the wall. There, there had been uh, 
a leaky pipe. And as I looked at the wall from the outside, I realized I was going to have to open up the wall. And when I cut open the wall and pried it back and started pulling out wet chunks of insulation, and I found a leaky pipe. And I was absolutely overwhelmed because I'm not a plumber and I'm not a carpenter. I mean, I can cut a board. I can drive a screw. I can cut a pipe. I can patch. I can paint. I can do all those things, but I don't have all the tools to do that job that needed done. And, and even more to the point, I don't have a sense for how it all goes together. I needed help. And I, I did a lot of the work myself, but I needed help. And so I reached out to a plumber and I reached out to a carpenter and the, and the job turned out great. I mean, it took some time. Things had to be done. We replaced some wood. We replaced some pipes. We, we, we replaced all the insulation. And it turned out beautiful. I, I drew, drew confidence from being with people who knew how it all needed to turn out in the end and how to get us there. And... Uh, and by the way, even along the way, I can make things worse if I do it by myself. I, uh, I, I managed to uh, drive a screw through a board and into a pipe. But it turned out great in the end because I knew who I was walking with. We need to follow someone who knows how it all fits together in the end. And that's not just true of bathroom renos. That's true of life. That's true of the uncertainty and the overwhelming age that we are walking forward into right now. And this passage in Isaiah has so much parallel to another passage in the book of Acts where God has shown up in, in Acts chapter 2 and the Holy Spirit has filled 120 believers after Jesus has gone back to heaven. The fire of God rests on them and people are shaken. They see and hear God at work. And after Peter preaches to the crowd, this crowd asks him, what do we need to do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. You see, God promises, like he did to Isaiah, God promises to forgive those who put their trust in him. He promises his presence and his power in their lives by his Holy Spirit. And what do they have to do? Just repent. Turn away from their sins and turn away from the things they have been turning to for their sense of stability and well-being. There's, I mean, there's, there's flat-out sins that you know you are wrong in your life and you need to turn away from, that is called repenting. When we turn away from the wrong thing, we turn toward God. But then there's things that might even not be so bad. They're just the things that we have trusted instead of God and they become idols in our lives. And we need to turn away from the worship of those good things as idols and turn to God for our sense of stability and well-being, and forgiveness, and wholeness. We need to turn to him in the name of Jesus. And the promise was for them, and a promise is for us, and for anyone who will call, who God will call, and who will answer that call. The call matters. <laughs> Being called matters, because, well, let me give you some reasons. It means that somebody who matters wants you. Man, to walk into everyday life right now with the knowledge that someone who matters wants you. Man, calling matters. Calling matters because it means that someone who knows what's going on is leading you. And calling matters because the one who makes and shakes the earth is in you. Have you heard that call in your life? Have you answered that call? Have you declared that call? Jesus says he wants people to declare that call by being baptized, by announcing publicly that they have received God's call and decided to follow Jesus. And I'll tell you this, that every follower of Jesus has experienced the call of God. 
maybe in some loud, profound way, and maybe in some quiet way that was very personal and, and, and intimate only to you. But, but every believer has experienced the call of God in their life. You can't come into a relationship with Jesus Christ without being called into it. And that's why, in fact, that the church is called the ecclesia. It's a word that literally means the called out ones. It's a community who are called to be set apart holy for him. And the only way into that community, into that relationship with God and his people, is for God to bring you in. He has made a way. Not, not by any more a sacrifice on the altar. Isaiah was, was thinking about a sacrifice on the altar. Because for many years, God's people would sacrifice a, a sheep or birds or, or goats or bulls and pour out that blood on the altar and trust that God had, through the death, the, the shedding of blood of those animals, that God had made a way for them to be forgiven, that the animals died in their place. But that system is gone because Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb of God, died once for all, the Bible tells us, to bring you to God. He is the one now who, if his life touches your life, if he enters you, you can be made right. You can be forgiven. You can be right with God through the sacrifice that was offered, not on the altar, but on the cross. And so we are called called out to be a community that is set apart for God so that he can send us back in to the world to call others with the good news that there is still a king on the throne. When your sense of equilibrium and stability and well-being is shaken up, when you've got questions about where is it all going from here, there is still a king on the throne. And a few chapters later, in Isaiah chapter 8, uh, a few days later in my reading, Isaiah was confronted with a, a situation where the people in Jerusalem are completely torn. You see, As Assyria was a world power that had risen up, and, and they were kind of dominating everyone. They were a threat to everyone. And there's two nations, Syria, not Assyria, but Syria, whose capital was Damascus, and the northern kingdom of Israel, whose capital was Samaria. And Syria and Israel were teaming up to defy Assyria and say, we're not going to give in to them. We're not going to let them rule us. And they showed up at the southern kingdom at, Jer at Jerusalem, and they said, we want you to team up with us. You know, jo join us so that we can fight big government. And their threat was, if you don't join us, we'll wipe you out. And so the king, the king is tempted. Do, do, I, do I go in with Assyria? Do I pay them off so that they can take care of us? Do I go in with the superpower and trust them to keep us safe? Do I align myself with the other, with the other powers and defy them? And that's the question so many people are facing today. What do I align myself with? What's the right choice to make? What team do I put myself on? And here's Isaiah wondering, what, what does a prophet have to say into all of this? And God gives Isaiah a very personal message. Most of the book of Isaiah is God's messages through the prophet Isaiah to the nations. There's a couple of places where he speaks directly to Isaiah. And in Isaiah chapter 8, verses 11 to 13, God gives Isaiah a very personal message to him. For this is what the Lord said to me with great power. To keep me from going the way of this people. To keep me from doing what everybody else is doing. And this is God's message to Isaiah. Do not call everything a conspiracy that these people say is a conspiracy. Now, don't get wrapped up in who's right, in what team to pick. That's not your first question. Do not fear what they fear and do not be terrified because so many people make their decisions based out of fear. They get agitated and, and ramped up and they're scared. What, you know, what will I lose? What will be taken from me? What will this cost me if I, if I don't get it right? 
And he says to, uh, to Isaiah, don't fear what they fear. Don't be terrified. You are to regard only the Lord of armies as holy. Only he should be feared. Only he should be held in awe. So here's the invitation. Park your fears right here. Build your confidence here that God is in control. And whatever it is that makes you lose sleep at night, you know, before you run off and do a Google search on that thing, or before you run off to your coping mechanism of choice, take that thing to God. So in the morning, you've still got work to do. In the morning, you've still got choices to make. But in the night, whenever it is that your worries get you all ramped up, before you run to anything else, run to God. Only He should be held in awe. In fact, tomorrow is a big choice here in Canada. Tomorrow, you've got to choose. Am I going to vote or am I not going to vote in a federal election? Who do I vote for? And by the way, I encourage you to get out and vote. Uh, the Apostle Paul made full use of his privileges as a Roman citizen. He just always remembered that he was first citizen of a higher kingdom. But make full use. If you have the, the ability and if you have the privilege of casting a vote tomorrow, I hope you do it. But before you do, remember that God has things going on that go way beyond who's in office in any given day. His agenda is way bigger than you could ever imagine. Give God bandwidth in your life before anything else. And only then do what you need to do. Move into the rest of your life from a place of peace instead of a place of anxiety. Move into the choices that you have to make from a place of confidence instead of a place of fear. Move into the actions that you need to take from a place of rest rather than a place of frenzy. And then you can say, not to the world around you, but to the God who sends you, to the God who has called you, here I am, send me. In Isaiah 26, verses 2 to 4, this is a, a blessing. It's a call, but it's also what I want to give you as a blessing today as I close. And it is, open the gates to all who are righteous. Allow the faithful to enter. And by the way, our righteousness is not our own righteousness. As Christians, we know that our righteousness comes purely from Jesus. That's why we can be righteous. And that's why the gates are open to us because of Jesus. Open the gates to all who are righteous and allow the faithful to enter. God, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you. All whose thoughts are fixed on you. So trust in the Lord always. For the Lord God is the eternal. God bless. 